Well, I'm thoroughly irritated, and you know me, I'm a glass half full positive guy, but that game irritated me partially because of the state that Manchester United is in right now, that we couldn't score a goal against that, and of course the circumstances that surrounded the game, which is really frustrating. And I hope the staff and the players are irritated with themselves as well, so that we get a response somehow in the league game coming up. So much to dissect here, but I want to pull out a very, very good scotch to numb my frustration, and that's the Balvenie Double Wood. This stuff is so good, it should be at every single ground. It's not at every single ground, it's only at select grounds. Let's discuss Manchester United 1, Aston Villa 0. Well, the good news is that's the last game now without reinforcements coming. And I hope those reinforcements will be available in time for the league meeting between these two again, because we need them and we may need more than what we're currently linked with. And I'm glad that Steven Gerrard made mention we switched off center backs, both of them, and we didn't close down Fred fast enough. And who was that, you may ask? Why, Danny Ings. Danny Ings, who does not belong in this team because he was a poor signing for the previous system and for this system. Now, is somebody going to come out and admit it and say, Danny, you're too slow. That's why you're offside all the time. You can't beat anybody for pace, so you have to start early. Danny, have a seat over there because you're the wrong guy. If we were a possession team that always had the ball, we were always in the front third and you were a fox in the box who was moving around, nipping in just when the ball gets played and you score, great. But that is not our system. In the five minutes that Jaden Philogene Bedace was on the park. He had more bags of pace, more urgency, more bravery, and created more danger than Danny Ings did in 90. And yet he's on the bench and Danny Ings, because of reputation, is on the park. I did not have a 30-year glorious career in the game. I don't have four years of senior managerial experience. I do not have a UEFA Pro license. But even I can see, Danny Ings is the wrong guy. And so the question must be asked, because all things being equal, everybody associated with this football club must be held to the same level of account, to the same standards. At what point can we start asking more serious questions to Steven Gerrard, the new manager? Because he now has a losing record after nine games, four wins, five losses. When Dean Smith didn't make a prompt substitution at a time and in a game that was crying out for one, he was heavily criticized. Gerard waited until the 74th minute to bring on Anwar El Ghazi, who hasn't been involved at all, for Emmy Buendia. So at what point can we start asking more serious questions? When he has an entirely new squad of players? Because that's not going to be until well into next year. All right, this is the Holy Trinity. The three big issues or moments that defined Manchester United 1, Aston Villa 0 in the Emirates FA Cup, starting with an honorable mention. Douglas Louise is living on borrowed time at Aston Villa, in my humble opinion, definitely as a number six. It was not his best game. And I still don't know to this day, is Douglas Louise a player? Because if Morgan Sanson can't get into that side over Douglas Louise, Morgan Sanson is never going to play for Aston Villa. I get that six is not Louise's preferred position. He should be a dynamic eight on the left hand side of the park. But the amount of time, he makes the wrong pass or wrong decision at the wrong time really hurt us. And that game was a perfect example, an open game of why you need an elite number six and why we are missing marvelous Nakamba so much right now. Honorable mention number two, Matt Target is living on borrowed time. Unfortunately, I would have thought he would have played out of his skin in this game if he had heard the same rumors we're hearing, and instead it was the opposite. The wrong ball played at the wrong time. He just looked very tentative on it at times, and we just aren't seeing the defensively robust Matt Target at this moment, and it was obvious why we need an upgrade there in this game, in my opinion, and that certainly seems imminent. Third honorable mention, Matt Cash could be living on borrowed time if Kane Kessler-Hayden sees the opportunity, 
grabs it with both hands, feels no pressure, and just goes for it. Matt Cash made two monstrous defensive plays in that first half that prevented the game from being over at that stage. He had a block and he had a clearance from the shadow of the crossbar. Great moments defensively, take nothing away from him. In possession, he is a complete adventure. I don't think he knows what to do with it. And I still don't know to this day if he ever will know what to do with it in those pivotal moments. In the second half, with us needing a goal and us needing to keep possession, twice in a row he played the ball straight into touch. It's the inconsistency that is killing us as a club, and this is what you get when you go shopping in the championship inconsistency you're lucky if you get a five out of ten every game with sometimes an eight and a half out of ten now maybe it's a push for Kane Kessler Hayden but the lad is big strong has great touch great pace I hope he sees the opportunity and without any pressure just goes for it because it'll make him better it'll make Matt Cash better and it'll make the football club a whole lot better Last honorable mention, how many fouls are you allowed to take before you finally get booked? Because Luke Shaw got away with murder in that game, in my humble opinion. In fact, in the 30th minute, his tackle on McGinn should have been a yellow card. I don't even think that it was a foul. He gets to take four more fouls, felt like there was more, and finally on the fourth of those, when he stopped Jacob Ramsey from getting through on goal, he gets yellow carded. And then there's the moment later where his flailing hand knocks Ezri Konza in the nose, bloodying it, but that wasn't a foul or worthy of a VAR review, but we'll get into that later. Number three, the Watkins chance. Oh, the Watkins chance. He had one earlier where Tyrone Mings flicks a ball from the corner. He's at the back post. Lindelof gets a little touch and he can't get around of it to poke it in at the back post. But on the half hour mark, Ollie Watkins has the best chance of the match for Aston Villa that isn't called offside. It was a hopeful up and under. Lindelof misreads it and Watkins does the hard part. He closes it down for pace, muscles Lindelof off the ball, and then for some reason he decides to go for power. Now it's easy for me from the comfort of my couch to look at this moment and say, you just got to place it there. The ice cold clinical finishers just place it. You have De Gea at your mercy. You don't need power there. Slot it from that range. And he doesn't. He's falling. He leans back. It's off the crossbar and out. That had to be a goal to make it 1-1. And if that was 1-1... The game completely changes, and I think Aston Villa might have come away with something because that would have put the fear of doubt into a team that was already pretty fragile at Manchester United. Number two, VAR. Oh, VAR. Can somebody please explain to me how in the same prestigious, revered cup competition, you can have VAR at some grounds and not at others? I couldn't believe it when the commentator said that in the previous games on the Saturday. Well, there's uh, no VAR in this game, but there will be at others. Are you kidding? How can you not call into task the credibility and the integrity of this tournament if we're not operating under the same equitable rules? That is ridiculous. That's a joke and it's embarrassing. And I may sound like I'm Villa Bitter right now, but I'm thinking about Cambridge United the same way I'm thinking about Boreham Wood. It's got to be all or nothing. Not, oh, depending on which stadium you're at. That is utterly embarrassing. But then, after three and a half long minutes of deliberation and a frame-by-frame -frame forensic to decide that Danny Ings was in fact onside because Ollie Watkins didn't get a touch, why VAR decided we're going to re-referee this game and try to find something else to snuff out that goal. And lo and behold, Edison Cavani's brilliance as a dark arts master managed to provide that moment, even though Michael Oliver is standing not five yards to his right. Cavani apparently gets blocked off by Jacob Ramsey. Cavani's arms are already in the air. He's already falling down before he even makes contact. He would have never gotten to Ezri Konza to stop the ball that came across. And as I mentioned, when you look at it closely, he's already falling down. Jacob Ramsey is turning away and the goal is chalked off. 
And by my understanding, and I'm just going by what the commentators said, there wasn't even a VAR check when the butcher, Luke Shaw, caught Esri Konza in the face with a flailing arm, so much so it caused Konza's nose to bleed. Shaw's on a yellow card. It's in the penalty area. He's looking right at Konza when his arm flails away. You're supposed to be in control of your arms according to the laws of the game. But all this is Manchester United at Old Trafford, the darling of the television universe. We don't want to kick Manchester United out of this competition in the third round. They're our biggest draw. Now, if it happens at the other end, well, then maybe it's worth a look because, you know, you don't want to do that to a Red Devil player. And who's the referee? Why, it's Michael Oliver, who was only one dodgy penalty incident away from refereeing the perfect game at Manchester United. The same Michael Oliver that fell for Paul Pogba's con last year where he tripped himself in the box. Do you remember that one in the league game between these two teams which led to the game-winning penalty? The obvious bias towards the big, rich teams is starting to become more than an embarrassment. And everybody sees it. Everybody knows it. And it's why people cleverly create posters like this one. This is funny. This tells me that people are seeing it and it's not just my imagination. This is a real thing, the big six bias. And it's starting to put a bit of a damper on my enjoyment of the Premier League as a whole. And the number one big issue or moment that defined Man United 1 Villa nil, obviously the goal. You've got a Manchester United squad that is in complete and utter disarray. Talk of a player's revolt and the new warden coming in and putting his foot down and saying, I'm not having this. This is how we're going to have to play. And eight minutes in, you take the edge off the crowd. You take the edge off the team by switching off on the second phase of a corner. And it all starts because Danny Ings is too damn slow to close down Fred. He just sort of gets there. Do you think that this is grafting hard to prevent a ball being played into a box? I don't. And then McTominay, give him credit. He ghosts in at the perfect time. He doesn't get enough credit. All the ex-pros always said, well, that's horrible defending. It's never, what a great run by McTominay at a perfectly timed jump. No, it's a defensive error. But in this case, Ezri Konza and Tyrone Mings cannot sort it out. And for that matter, neither can Emmy Martinez. And so there you have it. Eight minutes in. The edge is off the crowd, the edge is off the team, and Aston Villa are forced to do something they are not bloody good at. Chasing a game. The biggest problem with Aston Villa Football Club right now is they are a classic neither-nor team. They can't keep the ball out of their own goal. They are so soft at defending. And then they can't score or take advantage of the chances they do create to make up for that part of it. So poor defensively, the clean sheet record backs that up. Poor on the attacking front, they don't score enough goals. They are trapped in between in this identity crisis that feels like it has lasted since this time last year. And I realize they're in the midst of a complete identity overhaul with the new manager and there's new talent coming in that they're going to have to integrate, but they need to latch onto something soon because there are three losses in a row staring down a fourth if they can't beat Manchester United coming up next. And the thing that worries me is the absence of the grit and desire that seemed to be present when Steven Gerrard first took over. And you know, the other frustrating thing about that game is we've now given Manchester United a little glimmer of hope hope some optimism heading into the league game when there appeared to be not very much around Old Trafford. Villa need a response at home now and if they don't get it they'll have four losses on the spin and I don't think we imagined that when we were beating Norwich 2-0 away. Interesting times ahead. Let's hope new faces are in and that they'll be available for that game. Until that time try to stay positive and up the not so mighty Villa at this point.